and uh, we'll get started. So my name is Christina Boss Hamilton, and um, I have worked in the labor movement for many years. And the last 11 years, I've been working as a lobbyist in Sacramento. And um, I come out of the United Domestic Workers, which is a union that represents in-home care providers and child care providers. And um, I was the legislative director for a number of years and basically learned um, a lot about how to build power, how to utilize it, and how um, sometimes using utilizing the power you have actually creates more for your more power. And I, and I think that that's a lot that some advocates don't necessarily understand. And um, I always loved working with different groups that have really um, righteous policies that they're trying to um, get across and sharing the, the techniques and the, the models that I found to be successful. And so we'll get started. So uh, let me lower this. Okay. So you, does anyone see the PowerPoint? I assume so. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Awesome. Thanks. The download. Oh, Nick needs the download. Actually, I'll, I'll put it again. See, this is why I need like an assistant or something. But that'll have to be for another day. Here, I'm going to put the PDF into the chat again. Okay, so everyone, you should see a PDF in the chat. Awesome. Okay, so let's get rolling. That's me. Uh, my The name of my firm is KBH Advocacy. That is also me. That is my contact information, as well as my LinkedIn and my Twitter handles. I would absolutely love if you find, found me on social media and uh, connected with me. That would be awesome. And I do wanna do a quick shout out. So this is my first time actually doing a partnership with a company, um, in this case, it's Subtext. They do texting platforms for activism. Um, they're trying to expand more into the advocacy, political advocacy realm. Um, what I find, found very interesting is that texting um, versus email, you have a lot more face-to-face um, -face, or I should say person-to-person, one-on-one, communication, people have a lot more um, response to the messages that you're putting out there. When I was at UDW, we used texting platforms a lot. Subtext is uh, one of those platforms and I recommend you check it out, especially if you work for an organization and you want to have some sort of direct messaging capacity with your members or your activists. So I already told you to go ahead and save the handout. So the name of this um, is All Politics is Local. I assume a lot of you have heard this uh, saying before. It supposedly was um, Tip O'Neill, former speaker of the House, um, who said it. Uh, it took me a really long time to kind of figure out what exactly this meant, because uh, at first glance, of course, you, you know, yeah, of course, all politics is local. Um, after working in politics, I, it took me, like I said, a couple of years to realize exactly that local is all politics, like everything that's happening in Sacramento, everything that's happening in Washington, D.C., all of it comes down to the issues that people face in their day to day communities. Um, you know, as bread and butter as you can get, that is really what motivates voters. Are you making their lives immediately better in a tangible way to them versus, you know, kind of more of these sort of ideological philosophical conversations, our ability to mobilize people at the local level is the most important thing that we can be doing in terms of impacting the higher levels. And so that's where uh, I'm coming from there. And I'd love to take a moment now to introduce our special guest, Assembly Member Ash Kaura, who um, represents San Jose, is a good friend and a stalwart champion for working folks. Um, first Indian American to serve in the legislature, chair of Assembly Labor Committee, and the Legislative Progressive Caucus. So, uh, Assembly Member Kaura, are you here? Hi, Christina. Hey, how are you? Good to see you. <laughs> Good. How are you? Where Where are you joining us from? I'm in LA right now, and so I, I made a little makeshift little uh, Zoom corner here in my uh, hotel room. Awesome. <laughs> I love the coffee, the coffee makers in full, yeah. you know, visual. <laughs> you can tell, yeah, that's how you know it's a hotel room, the tiny little coffee maker. 
Well, with that, and that way you're communicating how hard you're working. You're like yeah, course, coffee right next to me. <laughs> so I thank you so much for being here. You are um, the first special guest I've ever ha had on one of my webinars. Um, my goal for you joining us is to share from the perspective of an elected official um, what, so a lot of advocacy groups do a lot of different things. Yeah. We want to cut through all of that and get through what is the most effective in terms of the way for people to organize at the local level that actually motivates the elected to do what you want them to do. And in your case, we don't necessarily always have that issue with you because you're always doing the right thing. Um, we know that there's a number of electeds that don't always do the right thing. And our goal is how do we build community power so that the pressure from the community compels the elected to take the courageous votes to take the hard votes, um, even when they have big, you know, corporate or, or other interests in their ear. Um, what would you say from your perspective is the way that people can most powerfully influence your um, actions in Sacramento? Well, you know, it, it depends on the individual. Uh, I think that, and when I say the individual, I mean the elected official, right? I think that we'd like to believe that every elected official is looking at things in the same way and the, you know, looking at things simply in terms of what the best policy is. But that, the reality is that that's not what politics is always about. You do have folks that are going to be looking at it from different angles, including, um, you know, what impact it has politically and what have you. And, and I'm someone that actually came from the grassroots, meaning, you know, I was working as a public defender for 11 years before I ever became a, a council member. And I started a neighborhood association where I lived. Part of the reason why is that we had um, a, a lot of issues in the neighborhood and I felt with the neighborhood association, you can amplify your voice. It's not just one resident or a, right. a handful of random residents, you know, calling their council member, but you actually right. have an amplified voice. Right. Um, and, and I also worked a lot in terms of activism at the local level far before I was an elected official. And so looking at the different, you know, experience I have now, being an elected official for almost 13 years and then the decade or more before that uh, being active at the grassroots level, uh, I think that there's a, a wide range of, of lessons I've learned. Uh, but I think that the first thing is, is relationships, right? I think that when you know someone, uh, and I don't mean relationships, not necessarily, sometimes we think of politics relationships that, okay, someone that wrote a big check and what have you. Relationship is simply just knowing someone. I think that yeah. growing up is the number one thing you can do. A right. lot of council members, a lot of electeds have coffee, kind of open houses at their offices or coffee, you know, coffee, coffee with the council member, whatever it might be. Show up to those things. I think when you show up and build relationships genuinely, uh, and, and it's actually interesting to get to know who your representatives are, what makes them tick, what their motivation is, who supports them. Because, right. you know, when, when someone's running for office, you have different stakeholders, different interest groups. Well, who was behind them when they ran? Because that tells, again, like you, you judge someone oftentimes by who their friends are, who their circle right. of friends right. are. That it helps you understand what makes them tick. But when you get to know someone and your first interaction isn't that you want something from them or you're advocating for something, that's critically important because they'll know that you actually have a genuine interest um, in, in civics, a general interest in, in what they're doing now. Obviously, and I know some of the folks that are on the call here do have a very specific agenda, specific policy issues, specific organization they advocate for. But even then, when, I, when I'm in Sacramento, it's great to get to know folks um, You know, out and about. I've had coffee with folks, not with any agenda on their mind or mine. Um, and, and so getting to know folks so that when there is an issue that you need to contact them for or, or, or lobby for, uh, you're not a stranger, like, you know, it's a familiar face. It doesn't always mean they're going to do what you want or right. agree with you, right. but I think that it, it absolutely creates the opportunity to have the space to have a real conversation on the issues that matter to you. Right, right. I love that. And in fact, that's going to be part of the um, presentation as we move forward is doing the community coffees and the the local events that the electeds have, those are so important and nobody ever takes advantage of that. I totally agree with you. You want the elected to know your face in addition to your name. And especially at the local level, if you are gonna be out and about and active and engaged, then shoot, go walk up and you know shake hands. Hi, this is who I am. This is what I care about. And you know, I've, Pleasure to meet you. Do you have a dog? I have a dog, you know, whatever, right? Like it, it doesn't have to feel 
gross or fake. It could just be, this is what I care about. Yeah, I love that. Right. And the other thing I'll add to that, especially if you're going to our events, whether it's a town hall or a community event, you know, a, a senior scam stopper, we have a whole wide range of events that we do. Make sure that you meet our staff. Um, uh, you know, in the district office, district director, and field representatives in Sacramento, get a chance to know our staff. You know, if, if, if we, our staff, you know, when I'm in Sacramento, our capital staff, they have different issue areas that they are responsible for, right? They focus on the policy issues um, and not just those that I'm on the committees for, but, you know, we see a wide range of issues. So when we get bills that come forward, you know, and, and they help the staff me and briefing on those bills. Uh, in the fall, when we're not in session, feel free to reach out to them and say, hey, you know what? I focus on environmental issues. I understand you're the environmental lead for Senator McCullough's office. I'd love to get coffee and just introduce myself. Love People it. don't do that. And they yeah. should. They think that yeah. it's only important to know us when in right. reality, our staff does so much of the work and we listen to our staff. You could say they might be more important, actually. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but oftentimes, yeah. It, it, it I love it. So let's just go. It's just like voice, you know? Yeah. So let me ask you, here, here's my behind the scenes question for you. Are emails effective? Is it really just phone calls? What would you say is like the best like bang for your buck? You know, we, we, you know, our staff kind of monitors all of it. Um, I, I think that phone calls are helpful because it's a very personal, you're literally taking your time to call. Emails, yeah. can be, if emails personalize the email as much as you can, don't, because we, we do get slews of emails and now you'll get a, a, a certain network or a certain group will say, okay, email your representative. And so we'll get, you know, a hundred emails that look exactly the same. Right. And right. does that matter? Yes, that matters. It helps. Mm. It's much more impactful if you just send a personalized email or if you call, uh, I think that, uh, and also it matters what district you live in, whether you're on the city council, whether you're calling a council member, whether you're calling your state representative, we want to know if you're a constituent. And that's why there we, you go. We, okay. we ask, where do you live? Cause we actually document it. That's uh, right. Our, we, we have uh, a, a whole system, a, a program where we document when we get input from constituents. If That's we get right. a constituent calling us for a tax issue they have or EDD, that gets documented in our system until we resolve the issue. But it's the same when it comes to people advocating for certain bills. We document, okay, we got 50 people calling against this one particular bill, but you know what? Only two live in our district. And so it's really important that you call uh, those that call the representative of the district you live in. And that's why it's important to create a network, right? Yeah. Create a network statewide and say, okay, well, I don't live in Colorado's district, but in our network, we have six people that do. Let's inform them on this bill coming up. And if they so wish, they can call their representative. That's a great, okay. So you just, you went into my next question because I get this a lot. If you're not in the district, is it even worth calling or connecting? It's still worth it, but you want to always start, again, all politics is local. You want to start right. with your own representative first. It still matters, uh, but we're going we're gonna to pay closer attention if we're getting 30, 40 calls from our district. That, okay, well, this is, something, this is something that clearly our constituents are really tuned in on and, and have an opinion on, as opposed to sometimes we'll get calls from out of state, you know, <laughs> you know from folks that don't yeah. like the show that we're doing. It's okay, well... That's great, but I don't care. <laughs> right. <laughs> Go back to Texas. <laughs> Sorry, joking. Joking. Um, okay, so if folks have questions, um, I, I'd love to just raise your hand on the, the thing. Um, I'm trying my best to keep an eye on the control board while, while we're talking here. Um, so the other, the other thing I wanted to ask you, Assembly Member, is people tend to not pay attention to city council supervisor they you know for some reason in our in our society we we think federal oh you know president who who's in congress that's all that matters when we don't even realize that actually more impact and more control over your life is done at the most local levels possible and that if we are trying to impact that that's where we need to start well, um, and that's part of yeah. our, uh, our poor civics education in this country. I remember yeah. in high school and all that, you learn about Congress, Supreme Court, but you don't even, you don't learn about your city council or your school board members and, you know, water district, all these things. They, they have so much influence over your daily life. Right. In, in many cases, much more than federal representatives. And so, yeah, absolutely. It's, I mean, look, I was a neighborhood kind of activist and, and on a bunch of nonprofit boards. Then I was on a planning commission, a human rights commission then planning commission, then I ran for city council, and now I'm in the state assembly. 
most of us in legislative seats, whether it's congressional or state, started somewhere, whether it's school board, whether it's a, a, com a city commission. So remember that when you're going to, a, you're looking at planning at your city council, and in San Jose, we have 10 city council members and the mayor. Well, there's a pretty good chance that one of them, not guaranteed, but a pretty good chance one of them may be in the state legislature someday. Right. right. right or maybe in Congress someday. Right, um, right. And so uh, pay attention to that for the long, that's kind of the long view of it. The short view, the, the immediate view is that they're making decisions right now that matter on a wide range of issues. Right. And so you want to make sure you're electing the best representatives locally, um, because even at the state level, if we put down, you know, legislation regarding housing, for example, affordable housing, you know, we have a Democratic majority legislature that's very much pro affordable housing. We're trying to get funding down for that. But if you have a city that doesn't want to implement it, you're not going to get housing for, you know, you're not going to get affordable housing in your, in your city. I live in San Jose. The big cities in the Bay Area are building affordable housing, but right. a lot of the smaller jurisdictions aren't. And that right. is because who's being elected. To That's, right. That's right. That's right. And never mind things like um, redistricting. Uh, we, we have the, the I, I don't want to say luck, but we have an independent redistricting commission we're one of, I think, maybe two states that even have that. Um, in the other states, it's it's who the state officials are that determine the political districts. And, and that's why you get these really crazy gerrymandered districts. Absolutely. And, you know, I, I would also, and I want to be super respectful of your time. Um, one last question. In terms of getting involved with election type stuff, a lot of groups, as you know, don't have PACs. They don't have big financial dollars behind them. What they have is people power. And I think that the, the idea of getting involved in elections, like doing endorsements, candidate endorsements, it seems very intimidating and very like, oh, you know, we're too small potatoes for that. So. I would say the opposite. I would say start creating infrastructure to vet candidates, especially at the local level. So you start putting your people in where you want them to be. Can you, can you speak to that? Especially if you don't have the money, right? Uh, you know, like I'm, I'm one of two legislators out of 120 that does not accept corporate PAC money, which means that there's still a lot of money coming into our system um, from very large interests that have the money. But then you have groups like Sunrise Movement. Do, some, do you think elected officials want the endorsement of Sunrise Movement? Absolutely. Yeah. Right? And that's because it's created this grassroots movement that now has a power to that name. And that can absolutely be done at the local level. We have local groups that are very effective in San Jose, for example, other parts of California that are very effective at bringing folks together. They host town halls, candidate town halls, right? You can host a candidate forum, get together with three, four, five other groups and host candidate forums. And at the end of it, you all get together and say, you know, this is going to be the candidate that we support because they're aligned with our values. You don't think a local elect is going to want that stamp of approval? Absolutely. There are ways. It is intimidating, but at the end of the day, that's the only way that so many um, stakeholders and so many groups that are advocating um, for the community that are never going to match the money, Yeah, uh, but they're going to be affected. I mean, if you even look at labor, I mean, labor certainly has resources, but they don't have the same resources, especially at the local level, that these right. large, these right. large moneyed interests do. But what they do have is a brand, like you want to have that you know, labor brand support in many cases. Right. And they have the people and they're organized. Right. Right. If you organize Sunrise Movement does a good thing. If you organize the people to do phone banks, to do walking, I'm telling you, I want that, especially if I'm running for city council. Right. I'm gonna want a group that's gonna say, hey, we're gonna bring out you know 10 people every weekend to knock on doors for you. I want that more than I want 10 checks. You know, there you go. There you go. There's a lot of value in people power for sure. And and the other piece of it coming out of labor, you if you have people power and pack power, yeah. That's power. That, mm -hmm. That's how you move, you move uh, agendas. And, and what my personal goal, right, I want to see more Ashkaras in the legislature. I, I want you to have more colleagues that don't mm -hmm. take corporate, you know, donations. I want to see, you know, more political courage. You know, California, the great blue progressive state, we, we can't even get basic, uh, you know, anti-fracking, climate change, you know, things that like even other states have. And, and mm -hmm. you know, why is that? Like, we need more people who are willing to have courage and take the hard votes, regardless of what, what might happen after the fact. And so part of me doing this yeah. uh, is to try to get, you know, let's stimulate local ground level activist activity to start electing 
uh, people like us who can serve and, and hold true to their values. And it's um, challenging. Can, yeah. and I'll tell you, it's challenging because, I mean, first of all, like I, my one thing I always talk about is I didn't get elected to get reelected. I got elected to do what I believe is the right thing. And, you know, I get threatened of, over my career. People are like, oh, we're going to run someone against you. We're going to spend money against you. I Six million dollars are spent against me when I ran for assembly. And so that's okay. I'd rather do it the right way and not win or lose yeah. my reelection that's right. than, than compromise myself. But the, the reality is that there is a lot of fear based. And this, you know, th this is not even, I'm not even saying this as a criticism, but there's a lot of fear that's used to maintain the status quo. Because it that's is right. scary to go out on a limb. It is scary to go out uh, up against very powerful interests that have shown they can be successful in defeating incumbents. So, you know, we have to, what we have to do is create the space for right. people to be courageous. And yes. Only going to do that if we show that we have a movement behind them. That's that, right. So don't worry. Do the right thing. We've got your back. That's right. That's right. 100%. We, we have to create space. I love what you just said. Create space for people to be courageous because that's what we need right now is courage. Um, so before you go, do I have any, do folks have any questions for the assembly member? Go ahead, Dan. And good morning, Mr. Uh, Kara. How are you? Dan Oakenfuss from CFILC. I am a Capitol alumni. Uh, I used to work for a number of legislators there uh, while you were there. And uh, thanks for coming. Um, I have a question. This is my first foray into the uh, so-called third house. I left uh, the assembly uh, a couple of years ago and now I'm with uh, uh, the California Foundation for Independent Living Centers uh, doing their policy. Um, but in your mind, what constitutes a successful uh, grassroots visit by stakeholders coming to your office? What are the ones that you really remember? And what are some key Ooh, takeaways that attendees can uh, uh, get from uh, how to be um, better at their lobbying? No, that's a great question. I, great I, question. We, 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 and I, I try to have as many, I, I try to say yes to as many meetings as I can personally with folks. So I've seen the whole range. Uh, and I think, and I know it's challenging, especially when you get members coming up to Sacramento advocating. Uh, it's a little bit harder for them to be off the cuff. But for folks like you that do have the experience, be very clear what you're asking for. Get a sense of how, like early on, get a sense of how well the member or the staff member is aware of the issue or the bill that you're talking about. Because in some cases, I'll know a bill inside. I've even had people lobby me on my own bills. <laughs> like have a sense of how much you need to lobby this particular member or their staff, uh, as, a, as opposed to spending the first 10 minutes of the meeting telling them something they already know. Now, in some cases, you may need to do that. And that's why it's kind of hard to gauge. And that's why folks like you, especially if you're having members from around the state there, may have to kind of guide it a little bit in terms of how you do the lobbying. But I think get you never know how much time you have with us. As you know, sometimes we get called to a committee hearing. Sometimes we get, you know, a call comes where we just, we, you know, from the governor's office, whatever. And so try to get to your ask as soon as possible and then open it up to a conversation, a back and forth with the member. I think that that allows for a more effective uh, meeting where, you know, we get the chance to also share our thoughts on an issue. And if we don't agree, we can share why. Because sometimes, you know, the ask is done at the very end and I'm, I, I'm like, it may be a bill that I'm not supportive of or have questions and concerns about, but we only have two minutes left to talk about those concerns. So I would say, get to the ask sooner in the meeting than yes. and the further on. And if you have a number of bills to talk about, um, try to get that to the staff member ahead of time. So the member or the staff member, if the member can't make the meeting, is well aware of what be, what's being asked. And sometimes I'll say early in the meeting, thank you so much for sending me. Just, you know, I'm supportive of all your bills. How can I be helpful? And then the, the meeting is spent on how I can be helpful on your bills rather than going over each bill. Now, again, it depends on the member. Maybe the member is not aware of the bills and it's going to be really helpful to go over that. But I think having that, that kind of doing that work ahead of time and knowing ahead of time where each member or their staff is really helps have a more productive meeting. That's super. Love Great. that. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dan. Super question. And Rosanna. Um, thank you so much, uh, Assembly Member. Col Col is it Colra? Yeah, sorry about that. Um, so I have a question about um, how to engage city council because um, locally our city council has made their top priority um, equity, diversity, and inclusion. However, um, we as a grassroots organization, when Vecina want to hold them accountable for what that means citywide. 
Now the school district has some, uh, has addressed that um, with bullying, with uh, racial profiling, with, and as well as um, the local city police. But we want as a, a, a stakeholders here in the city to do something more, to expand the, the conversation more. And um, one of our ideas is to maybe do a town hall with um, either county or national uh, leaders to engage just the citywide community about what that means. Mm -hmm. So we have a tentative appointment with um, the mayor of our city to talk about this, but I'm wondering, because of the political um, kind of tone to it, especially in our city, how would be the best way to talk about and tackle an issue like equity, mm -hmm. diversity, and inclusion, and make it more educational versus political? That's a great question. And I, I love the fact that you mentioned first, everyone loves throwing those buzzwords around, especially politicians. Oh yeah, we're about diversity and inclusion, but then they never actually talk about what that actually means when it comes to policy. Because policy that gets enacted is diversity, inclusion, equity in reality. Otherwise it's just words. And so one of the things in San Jose, I think we, we, we have different groups that do a good job of actually, you know, so Silicon Valley rising. We have PACT. PACT does a really good job of bringing folks together and they'll invite, they'll, when I was in the council, they'd invite council members when they, they'd have an issue. It could be housing, it could be any other kind of issue. And they would talk about these issues. They'd have, uh, they'd break it down into work groups and all that. So when, if I went to the mayor of a city, I would say, okay, um, we're really happy that the city has, is embracing diversity, inclusion, equity. And so we would love to be able to have a town hall to actually engage the city uh, on what that means. And we would love to have you there. It would mean so much to us. And so what I would, and they, they can decline, but that's, you know, that, that, that I guess tell, speaks to how much they actually believe it versus just say it. But I think if you have um, a group, an event where you bring the community together and actually have meaningful conversation, get a facilitator. And so it's not political. We're not saying, oh, we, we're supporting this issue or we're supporting this candidate, but rather it's like, we love our city and we want to talk about what these words mean to us as a city. And invite the mayor, invite the council members uh, to be there. So we would love to have you be part of this dialogue and you break it down and you, you have different tables and you have a council member, one table, a mayor, another, and talking to their constituents. And at the end of it, you say, okay, this is what we came out of this. This is what came out of this. And, and let's then, the key is to always do follow up after that. And so make it less intimidating for an elected official to come to saying, hey, we're, we're not going to put you on the spot. Uh, at this particular meeting, maybe later on you will, when you, when you have a better sense of yeah. what you ask are in terms of right. diversity and inclusion. But right. I would say that start with an inviting event where you bring the community together and have very meaningful dialogue on it. That's what, you know, what I've seen has been successful in San Jose. That's, that's excellent. And I love the, what you just said about following up, yeah. <laughs> especially if it's the first time you've had that conversation and you don't want to put them on the spot but you clearly need to go back to them. You don't forget about it. And then you never, you know, and then they're happy that they, that you forgot and no one never, you know, <laughs> asked them to do anything. <laughs> so I want to be respectful of your time assembly member. I am absolutely so grateful that you're here and your, you know, bird's eye view of what this actually looks like in real life um, is super, super helpful. So thank you so much. And safe day in LA and safe travels back to the oh, yeah, no, the, Thank you so much. It's great to, to see you really helping to educate folks for everybody. Christina, I mean, you do, you've done a great job over the years of being a very fierce advocate, but someone that always, you know, is respectful and, and everyone enjoys working with. So I think it's, thank it's you. that's a tough thing to balance. And I think that that's, but, yeah. but you have got to be fierce and be clear on your advocacy, but do do it in a way that people don't mind seeing you again the next time you're advocating for something. <laughs> That's, right. That's right. Good point. You make enemies a lot quicker than making friends. Right. Thank you, sir. Have a good one. Take care. Bye. Okay. Bye. All right. Um, awesome. So let's get back to the presentation because a lot of the things that we just talked about um, we're, we're, are actually in the presentation. So also let me say this, if you have questions or you watch, have comments, um, please don't hesitate to raise your hand and talk because I don't want this to be like a college lecture. <laughs> I'd love for this to be interactive. So 
this is the model that I learned working for the labor movement. And this is what I found to be in effective in terms of actually having success, right? Your goal as an organization, as an organizer, as an activist, right? You want to do two things. You want to spend time growing your network, like how the assembly member said, maybe you don't have people in your organization that live in the district of this particular lawmaker. You want to expand your network to eventually get there, right? You would, your goal is to be a, as everywhere as you can be. And doing that by coalition building, by partnerships and alliances is a great way to start doing that until you uh, are at a capacity where you yourself maybe can grow your organization to, to become more of a statewide organization. So you want to spend time building relationships, spend time meeting people, forming alliances and coalitions. And then when you, you know, at the same time, you're activating them, right? A, a network is no good if you don't ever ask them to do anything. So uh, we're gonna break this down into the two pieces of growing and activating the network. So like I just said, right, alliances, coalitions, what other groups are out there with maybe similar missions? Um, I like to say the um, enemy, what is it? The enemy of your enemy is your friend. Um, this, is, this doesn't mean you, you're, you're like in love with people, right? You, you may have one issue that you can align on and that's fine. So lie, align on that issue again, so that you can expand your reach and get heard in more places. Um, community influencers, super important. People in the area who maybe have radio shows, um, TV shows, maybe somebody lives in the district or in your community who is, I don't know, maybe they, they are an entertainer or someone with some sort of presence and can amplify the message that you're putting out there. I always find it important to ask your members who do they know? Who do they go to church with? Who do their kids go to school with? Find out who knows who. Is there anybody in your um, current web that you can reach out to and, and you know, at least connect with on some level? And then um, clearly your elected representatives, right? Building relationships with them so that you can find ones that you have support with, that you can engage with, and maybe even build upon that to get into, you know, higher levels of support. All of this is about relationships. And um, I know it's it, it's so obvious that it's about relationships, but I think it bears repeating a lot. So much of what I do is spending time talking to people and listening and not just bulldozing ahead with like, I'm only calling you when I need something from you. That is the number one thing that is going to turn these electeds off is if they only see you when you're coming down and, and asking um, with your hands out, right? You want to get to know these folks. You want to understand what do they care about? What are their hobbies? What, you know, what schools do their kids go to? And this applies to everybody else, right? It doesn't mean you need to be best friends. It doesn't mean you need to be fake friends. It just means that you have issues that you may or may not align on. You can speak cordially. You can speak professionally and find things that you do have, um, community with, with them and, and engage on that level. So um, traditional and untraditional coalitions. I don't think this, in my experience, this is something advocacy groups do very well. Um, we have to find other groups that maybe 90% of the time we don't have, you know, work together or we're not on the same page, but that 10%, that's where we want to focus on. And so um, I want to point out, folks don't know, sometimes folks don't know, there are central labor councils all over the state, and in fact, all over the country. So the way that the AFL-CIO is organized um, is through central labor councils. In some cases, they're county, some cases they're regional, but these are the local councils of all the unions that um, exist within those territories. You want to start reaching out and getting to know who those folks are and again building relationships with them because you know one of the biggest um limitations that i see on the in terms of environmental activism is really inability to create solid meaningful alliances with labor the reality is there are a lot of labor groups that care about climate that don't want their communities to be polluted and you can align with them on that level, but you won't if you don't know who they are and they don't know who you are. So this is actually a helpful link 
it's also in the um, resources document. Um, neighborhood associations, statewide associations, all of these are groups that um, advocates at the local level, I would say, start by creating a map. Uh, we call it a power map and just start laying out who is out there and who do you want to be reaching out to. And I do have a poll. If you could take a moment. Um, does everyone see the poll? All right, awesome. Have you ever worked with your Central Labor Council? So, oh, there we go, okay. Anyone else have a, want to answer there? Okay, so what I'm seeing is what I've been seeing in the past, which is sadly 73% of you have not worked with your Central Labor Council before, and I suspect you may not know who they are. That is an absolute fundamental first step to start um, building these type of untraditional alliances. Thank you for that. Actually, there you go, I just shared the results. All right. And again, I wanna reiterate, if you have questions um, or comments, please raise your hand because I would love to hear from you. Feedback. Here's a great tip that um, someone taught me when I first started uh, lobbying. Who are your potential allies? Go and look at the bill analysis. All of that is public information. California has um, a fabulous ledge info site that you can download um, vote histories, uh, analyses, you know, everything you need to know. There's the link. The link is also listed on the um, uh, handout. So go and find a bill that, you know, where do you want to know what, what organizations came out on, um, you know, the criminal justice reform bill that you care about? Uh, what about the anti-fracking bill? What about um, whatever issue it is that you care about, right? Disability rights, um, you know, whatever the the... I would say not even, don't, I'm not saying the bills that you did, but bills that are in the arena, in the issue area, right? Find who submitted letters of support. If they submitted it before the print deadline, they'll be listed in the analysis. That is a fabulous way to find groups that you may not know exist and at least, you know, reach out and say, hi, hey, you know, we, we support this too. We oppose this too. Um, maybe there's something there that we can connect on. Your community influencers, like I said, your local press, um, congregations, some, some religious organizations are extremely active locally. Um, who are those folks? Who are, who are their leaders? And um, I also said this earlier, survey the base to find out who has relationships because you may be sitting on a gold mine that you don't even know because you haven't asked anybody. And then um, this is something that I, I feel like it's obvious, but it bears repeating, you know, find out who represents you at the local level. A lot of the times, and I speak for myself, for years, I had no idea who my, my assembly member was or my local uh, council member or county supervisor. This is a fabulous website that is for the whole country, actually. Um, you can find out to the absolute nitty gritty, uh, you know, every level from the neighborhood association up to Congress, uh, who is representing you. And, and that'll at least give you a starting point. Um, get on these people's mailing lists, find out, you know, go on their social media sites, you know, follow them, and then you'll start getting notified when they do these community events that you can then <clears throat> organize around. When you See who those folks are. These are really simple. Again, common sense, but not a lot of groups do this. Request a meet and greet with them, especially if they're not in session. When they are not in Sacramento, they're in the district and their job is to be communicating with you. That's what they're there for. So say, hey, I'd love to have a meet and greet. I'd love to introduce myself, my, my colleagues, um, you know, our executive board, our team, whoever, right? This is who we are. This is what we care about. Exactly what Assemblymember Kara just said. Get to know them so that when they see your name, they also can see your face. 
And when you show up again in the future, they're like, oh, I, I know who that person is. That, that's a now a familiar face to me. Get on the mailing list, follow them on social media. All of these things are extremely impactful. That will make the difference between not doing any of those things and then when a vote comes calling and saying, please support versus you've laid all this groundwork so that when the vote comes and you say, please support, their calculations are going to be different when you've laid all of this foundation. Here's another tip that um, people don't necessarily feel comfortable doing, but you should start feeling comfortable doing it. Ask the elected for a cell phone number. Ask their staff for a cell phone number. Um, they may or may not share it with you. I find most of the time they will. Um, they need to know that you are not going to be irresponsible with that information and you're not going to go uh, put that on blast so uh, everybody, you know, can start calling them or, or uh trolling them, you know, you, you want to be respectful of that, but that is a fabulous way to start connecting with these people one-on-one -on -one and getting them and getting past the gatekeepers who, um, you know, maybe you've got meeting requests, but you've never been able to actually get your meeting. It may be that that elected doesn't even know you requested the meeting. So sometimes cutting through those uh, gatekeepers is uh, actually the only way you're going to get through to them. I like to look at campaign contributions, who funded these folks. That gives you a little bit more insight into who they are and what um, may motivate them or not motivate them. Not to say that they are only, you know, caring about the people who contribute. I just think it paints a fuller view of who, um, who got them to the position that they're in. And perhaps, you know, what interests may they be especially um, paying attention to? All of this is public information. And again, I find that a lot of activists um, don't know to take advantage of finding those things out. So then we talk about activating the network. Um, voter registration drives, common sense, so important, so important. People, if they don't vote, then really all of, it doesn't matter anything that we talk about, say on social media, Twitter, outrage, you know, Facebook rants, none of it matters if a person doesn't vote. Um, we, we see this with every election that we have, how close the um, tallies are. All of what we do as advocates has to be around educating, and registering potential new voters. And then when they are registered, getting them to actually vote, getting them to actually turn in their, their mail ballot or in your state, however it is that you do it, right? One of the things that labor does extremely well is turn out voters. And that is what these electeds care about. Will you help them stay in office? If you can show that you have a boots on the ground operation, like the assembly member said, if you can, you, maybe you can't write checks, but you can turn out 100 people every Saturday, every Sunday um, on election day to go and knock on doors and make sure that people actually went to the voting booth. That is more important in the end sometimes than any dollar amount. You want to say to them, I can show you I am bringing people to the cause of keeping you in office or getting you out of office, right? And sometimes just knowing that you have this organization behind you may be enough to impact how these people uh, behave. And um, I think we covered this with the assembly member, but I, I want to reiterate it again. So much of what governs our day to day life is conducted at the local level. And so organizers who only pay attention to Sacramento or their cap state capital or they only pay attention to Congress, you're missing 90 percent of it. The city council meetings, the board of supervisor hearings. All of these things are also where these big decisions are made. And what you don't want to do is be the person who never showed up or the organization that never showed up when these uh, things were being discussed. You know, they're, they, they allocate public time, public comment time when, when they're about to take action. So you want to be there and say, yes, no, up, down, you know, we don't care, we care, whatever it is your message is, be visible so that when the time comes, again, you are not just someone who popped out of the sky and they never saw before, right? This is all about the visibility. When they think about your organization, they need to be thinking about people coming to events and either, you know, talking, 
participating, whatever, right? You are not just a piece of paper and a name on a paper. You are in their minds, a visible element of their district. And also, as the assembly member said, one of the things that I find folks forget is to identify themselves as a constituent. Um, you want to foremost, when you make that phone call to those electeds or you introduce yourself to them, I live in this town. I am a constituent. They will pay more attention because you are potentially impactful to their future and their ability to remain in office. So that is another thing, you know, when you train your organization um, members to do lobby visits, incorporate that into your training. Make sure that everyone who introduces themselves says where they live. That will make a big difference. And then um, activating could be also things like um, local paper letters to the editors, uh, local reporters contacting them, calling into local radio, especially if you're an issue-based organization where you have expertise in a certain area, you know, it would be fantastic to, to present yourself as an authority on an issue. And I'm telling you, reporters want those people so that when they're writing their stories, they know who to call to get an opinion from. So become that person or that organization that when you know a certain issue is being discussed, they immediately call you to get your take on it. All right, and I wanna um, reiterate for those who may have joined late, there is a PDF in the chat that says advocacy resources. Um, please make sure to download that because it has the links um, and other information on there that you will find helpful. And then um, also, as we talked about with the assembly member, getting involved in your local elections, you, you don't need to have money. Again, following the elections, getting involved, vetting candidates, doing endorsements, all of those things are super important. Join your local Democratic Party clubs. Um, I assume, you know, I, I, I don't, have too many Republicans who join my webinars, but if you're a Republican, I guess you could you could join your local party clubs. But the point is, get involved locally. The, the party has groups all over the state at the local level. Um, this is something that I only learned a few years ago. Run to be an ADEM delegate. So let's let's talk about ADEM. First, we'll do our poll though. All right, do you see your, your poll question there? Have you heard of ADEM? You know what I'm even talking about. All right. So 6040, several of you have heard of ADEM before and some of you have, more of you have not. So let's get into that. Oops. So um, the assembly district, e God, what does it stand for? Assembly district election, something, something. Anyway, it's a, being a local delegate to the Democratic Party. This is California specific, everyone. Um, becoming an ADEM delegate, running a slate of candidates to be delegates. These are the people who vote on the actual party business at the conventions. So these are the folks that will vote on official candidate endorsements. This is very important if you have a candidate that you want to get elected. Having the endorsement of the statewide Democratic Party can make the difference between having thousands of dollars of resources and uh mailing lists and all sorts of other <laughs> things at your disposal versus not. So let me tell you, candidates will jockey and fight for these endorsements. If you care about which candidates are being elected, you should try to get involved in being one of those delegates or at least folks in your network. Um, these are the folks that make the decisions at the conventions as to where the resources of the party go. Yes, I will share the slides. Um, actually, what I'm trying to do is maybe even put it into like a little ebook or something. But 
Yes, I'm, I'm happy to share the slides. Yeah, thank you. All right. And I'm trying to move fast because uh, we've been going at it for a while. So slow and steady wins the race. That's actually one of my personal mottos, but it's also a professional motto. You have to recognize as an organizer that there's only so much you can do. Um, and you start where you are and you take it day by day, step by step. A lot of what I'm telling you takes time to do. It takes years to build those networks. Um, it's very easy to get overwhelmed and to throw up your hands and say, well, it's just too much. We, we can't do it. We don't have enough resources. And I, I totally get that. And what I want to just throw is a word of caution that that sense of overwhelming and frustration is so common and such a um, debilitating feeling that will basically prevent you from doing what it is that you can do. So I always recommend slow and steady, take small chunks, pieces, start with small pieces, build momentum over time. These are things, this infrastructure of community network and activating network takes time. And it's okay that you can't do it all at once. You know, we, we are community groups. We don't have unlimited, you know, resources. We're not, we're not getting funded uh, by the Bezos and the Bloombergs of the world. And then we start with where we are. All right. Thank you for joining us, Usama. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. <laughs> And then the other thing I would like to say is teamwork. Um, this is not, I keep saying you, but I don't mean you. I mean your, your people, right? These are things communities do. This is not one person uh, is going to be a, a superhero and do all of these things. It's impossible. So what you want to do is remember that there's folks around you, right? This is why being organized is so important. You want people around you of like mind so that you can share the work and, and, you know, have folks do what makes most sense for them to do. Maybe they like doing certain things and not other things. So you have to remember this individualistic notion of saving the world is really like a totally wrong and b the quickest way to burn out and fade away. Um, rely on the people around you that share the same goals and values in order to approach all of this from the collective perspective than the individual. And so um, this, again, is the model that I learned that I uh, saw being put into effect and, and used successfully. And um, I want to encourage you again, download the resources handout. Um, you can sign up for uh, text updates from me. Actually, it's super cool. It's the subtext platform. It's interactive as well. Um, so that if you have questions, it, it comes to me directly. It's not a group text thing. It's just individual. Um, I'm really more interested in texting than emailing. Uh, I feel like email like blasts or, you know, people kind of tune out. Um, but I'd love to have you uh, subscribe and become a text, uh, text person with me. Um, and I promise I will never spam you or send you anything that I don't think is very valuable to you as an advocate. And um, finally, would love for you to um, tag me on social media and share your, um, share your comments, feedback on today's uh, webinar. I do other ones. Um, all of this is part of my business as a uh, consultant to try to share the models that um, are successful in terms of how activists can gain power and use power in order to change the world, in order to make the world a better place. And so all of this is part of my, you know, basically outreaching on behalf of myself, my business, but also just sharing with, with the community the things that I know work. Um, and uh, would love for you to help me spread the word on that. So thank you very much. And does anybody have any questions, comments? Again, would love your feedback. I will send you a quick survey for your feedback. But if you have anything you can share now, I would be very happy. Awesome. 
Okay, well, thank you guys. Um, I am going to have a recording of this also that I can share with you and um, just reach out to me afterward and let me know. Uh, let me see in the chat here. Awesome. Yes, Alex, please, let's connect. That sounds super. And I'm really grateful that you guys uh, joined me and please get on my list so that you find out what other webinars are I will be doing in the future. Have a awesome day.